Hello, everybody. Thanks for joining us today. Uh, my name is Rebecca Thistlethwaite. I'm the program manager for the Niche Meat Processor Assistance Network based at Oregon State University. Uh, today's webinar is called Think Inside the Box, Containerized Meat Processing Solutions. Uh, a little bit about NPAM. Uh, NPAM does webinars on topics related to small scale meat processing and farmers and ranchers who raise meat for local and niche markets. If you'd like to be on our email list, please sign up at our website, which I will put in the chat box. And if you ever have any webinar topic suggestions, please let us know. We're always open to developing webinars to meet your needs. Um, NPAM is a network of processors, farmers, ranchers, university extension agencies, uh, government officials, nonprofits, and others. And our mission is to su support small and very small meat processors as essential partners in bringing local sustainable meat and poultry to the market. Uh, we're also part of Extension, and which is an e-extension, which is an initiative of the National Land Grant University System. Um, just a few logistics about today. Uh, we will have a few minutes after our first presentation to take a few questions, and then we will reserve about 15 minutes at the end for more extensive Q&A. Um, as Mark said, please try to use the Q&A box if you can, if you have questions. Uh, also, the webinar is being recorded, and we'll post it on our YouTube, uh, our NPAM YouTube channel. Uh, next week. So if you have a friend or a colleague who wanted to, to see the webinar and weren't able to attend, they'll be able to see all of our slides and our audio on our uh, recording. So we have a full agenda today and we'll try to get to as many questions as possible. But if for any reason uh, we aren't able to answer your question, just go ahead and email it to me and I will um, try to take care of it later. So I'm typing, let's see, nichemeatprocessing.org. So if you aren't part of our listserv, just go to that website and you can join our listserv. All right, so our topic today um, is gonna be a fun one. Setting up a processing plant, whether it's for red meat or for poultry, can be a daunting and expensive task. Capital costs are high, return on investment is slow, and cash flowing a plant can be nearly impossible in the first one to five years. What if there were models for both slaughter and cut and wrap that were not only cheaper to erect, but practically turnkey, where you could get up and processing in a matter of weeks rather than months or even years? Or how about plants that could be built on smaller scale farms and better match the volume being produced on that farm? Today we will share two such models. Uh, the first one is primarily for cut and wrap, and the second one is primarily for poultry slaughter and processing. But as you hear from the speakers, there's, there's other options to use uh, both of these models for. So our first speaker today will be Dr. Michelle Fannensteel, uh, who has her doctorate in veterinary medicine and served in both the Peace Corps and the US Army. She runs Dirigo Food Safety, a food safety consulting firm, and is a certified HACCP auditor. She lives on a farmstead in southern Maine with her family, where they raise a few critters and experiment in the kitchen. Michelle will be discussing her new locker prototype, which is a customizable refrigerated container that also comes with Michelle's excellent HACCP planning services. Uh, after Michelle, we'll have David Schaefer, who is the founder and owner of Featherman Equipment, a company dedicated to manufacturing equipment for the small scale poultry producer. He has also farmed for many years, raising pastured poultry, grass fed cattle, and other critters. David ha has also been on the board of the American Pastured Poultry Producers Association for years and provides invaluable experience to that group. David will be discussing his plant in a box which is also a shipping container uh, like the locker. And this one is designed for slaughtering and processing poultry species, uh, but is also flexible and could be used as a commercial kitchen. So I think we will start off with Michelle. Michelle, are you ready? Yes. 
I sure am. Thank you so much. Give us a minute while we go to go to screen sharing here. And there we go. All right. So I think you can um, hear me and see me. So thank you, everybody, so much for coming. Again, I'm Dr. Michelle Fannin Steele, and uh, my consulting company works up here in Maine. We're really excited to talk about the locker. So let's uh, let's get going. Um, what I really want to talk about today is the return on investment. As Rebecca said, you know, doing business planning and calculating the return on investment for small scale production can be really, really challenging, and that's what this locker grew out of. It grew out of uh, a need need for clients uh, to have a space that they could get up and running and not break the bank. And so, um, so that's what we're going to uh, talk about today. Um, so, but you know, I will, I will tell you, I, um, I have done a lot of entrepreneurship and business planning. I went through the entrepreneurship boot camp for veterans with disabilities, um, where we learned a lot about business planning and I have applied that and worked with all of my clients on that because you have to think about, um, a whole set of things before you make investments in capital infrastructure, especially when we're looking at USDA approval facilities. That can be a little bit of a black box and a little bit confusing. Um, and then down here at the at this end of the the animal foods market, we talk about whole animal utilization. You know, everything but the squeal and making money on all of that. So I'll talk a little bit about that. And then finally, we're going to talk about the investment costs and the returns on actually uh, having a locker. So um, I will tell you when I'm in presentation mode like this, I can't actually see questions. So we'll, um, um, we'll deal with that as it comes. <laughs> okay, so why do we wanna, why do we wanna learn this? Um, and the real question, and this is the question that I ask everybody is, is whether or not you have the supply chain and the demand chain to support a cut and wrap facility, okay? Uh, a pasture fed, um, steer takes 24, 26, 27 months to grow out. Uh, and what are you going to do if you spend a million and a half bucks on a cut and wrap facility and you don't ha can't secure the supply chain? Um, you need to solve those problems before that million and a half dollars is spent. Okay, so we're going to spend some time um, evaluating how the locker is going to fit into your business planning and building the locker into your business planning. And what I'd like you guys to think about is how, what brought you to the point that you need a facility? Investing in capital infrastructure is expensive, but it builds an asset and builds wealth within your company. And if that's the correct next step for you, that's awesome. But you need to figure out how you got to that point. Okay, so uh, here are some reasons why people end up investing in capital infrastructure uh, to, to cut their own animals. Um, so the, 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 the biggest one is that um, they're underwhelmed at the options out there. They don't uh, like the way their animals are cut. They have too many problems with their, with their uh, slaughter facility who are trying to do two really gigantically different tasks, you know, kill animals and then cut and wrap and potentially do value added processing. It's pretty hard, okay? Um, a lot of people get into this, they want, they worked really hard raising their animals and they wanna maintain control over their value chain. Um, they think they can do a better job. I mean, there's a lot of training out there on how to do whole animal utilization and how to make these awesome, great products. And if you live in, you know, as the, the title of our list serve is the niche meat processors. If you found a niche where you can sell really awesome products, you want to control that. And uh, you want to understand what's happening with your brand in the marketplace. Because the truth is, is that if you have a slaughterhouse and you use them as a co-packer for your meat products, it is your label that goes out into the marketplace. And if there is a recall, it is you who must execute the recall for food that is labeled with your label, even if it's something that happened at the slaughterhouse. Okay, so it gives you more control over your value chain when you have your own capital infrastructure. So our locker is designed um, for cutting and wrapping retail cuts and for creating value-added meat products. So what do I mean by value-added meat products? Well, um, you know, bacon boxes <laughs> kind of is what we're <laughs> kind of what we're talking about. There's a lot of people talking about doing this for uh, charcuterie production as well as um, 
as well as doing uh, more whole car, you know, other kinds of whole carcass cooking and utilization. I'm going to go through a pate return on investment. So you can see that sort of thing. And the idea is, is that the space is customizable so you can do and get good at what you need to do and create that and, and really s secure down that supply chain um, bef at, at, in, in an order of magnitude less expense than building a brick and mortar facility. Okay, and so that once, you know, you have your supply chain, you have your process, and then it takes time to go out and develop a customer base. This is not if you build it, they will come. Okay, these are designed so that you can process only a few days a week and make money, and that gives you time to go out and sell. <laughs> okay, <laughs> so, um, so the question that I want you to think about is, is when you think about facilities, when you think about issues that you've been having or where you are in your business development, does what I'm saying match your experience? And if so, how? And take some time to think about that so that you can understand where the locker might fit into your, your plans for business growth or expansion. And so one of the things we say that is that this is a USDA uh, approvable facility. And that means that it, um, this is a, it's an upcycled shipping container. It's designed to be almost plug and play. You tell us, you know, what kind of equipment you want. We have, we have, you know, recommended equipment and all that sort of stuff. Um, but it comes, uh, it has to get hooked up to a potable water source. Okay. So that means you gotta, you gotta test the water. Um, uh, a way to get rid of uh, waste uh, and water waste and the in order to do you know in order to prove to the USDA you have to get these letters um, it has totally cleanable floors walls and ceilings there it's a built-out stainless steel walls and ceiling and diamond plate flooring um, it hooks up to a place that has storage office and a bathroom there is a donning and doffing part of this which you'll see on the diagram when I show it and um, the, um, but it needs to be hooked up to a place with an office and a bathroom, okay? So there are many farm facilities where that stuff is already in place. Um, and if you are doing diversified farming, this is one of the things that you're gonna have to consider in FISMA and whether or not you're gonna have to conform with FISMA. But you should have a place if you have a diversified farm and you're selling into the commercial food stream where you have a sanitary bathroom and this needs to go near that. All right, and then finally, this comes with three months of food safety consulting from Dirigo Food Safety and up to four HACCP plans that uh, we help you get through the USDA grant of inspection process. Okay, we believe in what's called programs-based food safety. We write the programs that support the HACCP and create a validatable HACCP that's in conformance with the validation guidelines that were published, you know, getting on two years ago. Um, and so we have laboratories that we work with and, and that sort of thing so we can get you up and running. And with, uh, with work, you can, you can be up and running within three months. So that's, um, that's what we have. And so I'm not going to read this. I'm not going to read all of this to you. But the idea is, is that this is modular. It's not mobile. Okay, this is not designed to go from farm to farm. It's designed to go to a farm. Uh, in almost all jurisdictions, it would not need to go through the permitting process because it is not a permanent fixture. Okay, uh, there are ways we can work with you to um, get an appropriate um, footing set down. You don't necessarily have to pour a wicked expensive concrete pad. Um, and it, it's, it was originally actually designed to go into exurban industrial parks, which have sewage, water, and electricity. And they are... Um, uh, then and these are I mean they're shipping containers they it's they're, our prototype is sitting inside a warehouse in an industrial park in Brewer Maine right now um, and it's perfect like truly it's it's perfect um, so it's designed to be efficient and to promote um, hygienic flow of food so the raw materials come in one end the people come in in the other and then they meet in the middle after the people have washed and they get packaged and leave where the people the food gets packaged and and leaves where the where the people come in um and it 
the all the food safety planning that we do is GFSI compliant. GFSI is the Global Food Safety Initiative. Okay, so that means our documents are compliant with what they are looking for. It is not a GFSI ready set of food safety plans. It doesn't need to be at this point, but it helps you begin as you mean to continue. So if your goal is to sell into big distributors or into big retail, they are going to require audits and at some point they will have to be global food safety initiative audits. Okay. So that's, that's, that's what it is. Uh, and the idea is, is we believe here in, um, in, uh, at Derigo Food Safety in working in refrigerated space. Uh, if you work in refrigerated space, it makes a whole lot of pathogens not reasonably likely to occur, and therefore they don't need to be controlled in your HACCP planning, and therefore your life is easier, <laughs> okay? Um, so um, we can customize it with a variety of things that uh, you might need or we can sell you the box because you already own the stuff and you know we're in Maine a lot of people don't want to go through the extra expense of having somebody source their equipment or they already own their equipment and they just want the box and we're totally happy to um, to work with you on on that <laughs> Okay, um, so this is what it this is what it looks like. All right. So if you look at uh, if you look at this, we have um, if you look at I want you to look at either end first. Um, so on the leftmost side of your screen, um, that's where the people come in, and on the rightmost side of your screen, um, where that door is, that's where carcasses come in. Um, this is divided into two spaces, okay? Both are refrigeratable. Um, one can be uh, refrigerated, so the, the unit on the right, um, or the, the space on the right can be refrigeratable. And if you wanna use the whole um, space on the left as a curing chamber, we can hook up an HVAC system that will keep it in the right conditions uh, to use as a curing chamber. So that, you know, there's some other considerations for that, but it can it can be done uh, it can be done that way. Um, it can hook up for a smoker for appropriate um, smoking and cooling uh, of product. And again, the whole thing is cleanable, and so um, it can conform with um, the USDA standards for storage and high risk non food contact surfaces. So you don't have to cover everything in storage as long as it's cleaned. Okay, so this is kind of what it would look like. Um, the process flow is the meat comes in. We're, um, this comes with a meat rail because I, you know we're all in this for the long haul and we need our backs to work for a very long time. Um, and plus having meat rail is a little more hygienic, but it is, everything is quote, cut in the cradle over there on the work table. Um, there are um, grinders and tumblers, places to, um, to wash things out, a three, three compartment sink. Um, and then this is a model showing uh, where you would smoke. So that smoker oven um, that we have sourced for this will smoke 240 pounds of bellies at a go. Um, and then they then it moves into the fridge to cool down according to Appendix B, for those of you who know what that means. Um, and then the other side of the table is where we have um, packaging and uh, labeling. And then everything leaves. Um, through the um, through the portal on the on the left, which is the donning and doffing station, um, so it's a linear flow of food, uh, which is the most hygienic way of of designing these things. It is, um, uh, yeah, because it keeps the raw stuff with the raw stuff and the and the stuff that has passed your critical control point all together and away from the raw stuff. Okay, so this is some of the pictures that we have. Um, this is an incredibly difficult space to photograph well because all the surfaces are reflective, okay? Um, so I just kind of want to go um, in and kind of tell you where you where you are in this. But if you start at the one o'clock position, um, that's, a, that's the donning and doffing space and the at that one o'clock position and then at the, um, at the right side of the screen, those are two sliding glass doors like you would have in your house and they let in a beautiful amount of light because, you know, unfortunately sometimes working in a meat locker is, feels like working in a cave, but they let a great amount of light in. All right, and you can see in this how the surfaces are all cleanable, all right? And so that's the size that we're trying to give you um, some perspective on what the, 
the size of the second um, compartment where finished product is. Okay, and then the big picture in the middle of your screen um, is the um, compartment where the raw materials go. The meat rail would be up on the up on the top, uh, attached to the ceiling, <laughs> uh, and coming in through the door on the leftmost side. Um, and there's a divisor, and where that chair is is where the three compartment sink goes. And there's a wall right there. Okay, um, and then the other picture is just trying to give um, some sense of, of depth perspective uh, through the through the facility uh, from um, that picture on the on the bottom left is from where the carcasses are and then that picture on the top right is looking straight through it as if you were at the um, sliding glass doors okay and so we designed this because what we believe in at Durago Food Safety is nose to tail utilization all right I'm a veterinarian I believe that food safety starts on the farm I believe that our animals have one bad day and that's the day that they are slaughtered and go to freezer camp as we say um, but it also means that we believe that we respect the animal as much after it has died as, as while we were raising it on the farm, okay? And part of that is having appropriate facilities and appropriate production systems so that the meat does not get thrown away and minimal, minimal waste is created and more efficient small businesses are created as a result of that, okay? So this is one of the driving needs of our business is to help, um, Small businesses grow through you uh, through whole animal whole carcass utilization. So, but what does that mean? Okay, you know the short version is, and if you want these the, these, I'm going to run through some spreadsheets, um, and we're not going to go through the math. I can go through the math with you on a phone call, but truly, learn to make country pate. Okay, develop a market for your special brand of country pate, and you know put the put a picture of a you know cute pig on it or your grandmother or something all right but what we've done for you is we have done a um an inventory analysis of what it costs to make pate all right and pate is made from all the meat that you would throw away sausage saucy song uh, and saucy sesh are made um from hams that you you trim out specifically to use for that pate is all the rest of your trim okay so this is a very french way of of approaching this okay but these are real numbers all right um and i'm happy to walk through this with you but here's the here's the long and the short of it all right this is how you do um inventory management and inventory accounting uh for um value-added production in a hog <laughs> um, and the idea I want you to look at that number 423.55 all right so your total cost of um, doing making making pate uh, from a pig is six hundred and seventy six dollars and sixty six cents okay that accounts for boxing and overhead and the makeup and or a markup and that sort of thing and so what does that actually end up meaning Okay, that for if you noticed on there that created 84, 84 servings of 200 grams, 200 grams is about seven ounces. Okay, um, and if you sell those seven ounces, then your total revenue, okay, all the money that you bring in, a little over a thousand dollars. Okay, and that you get a return on investment of stuff that you were going to throw away of almost 50%. Okay, those kinds of margins are the margins that allow small businesses to thrive. Okay, and imagine if you could take that revenue, all right, and reinvest it in your workers. Um, you know, put more food on the table, buy new fencing, buy new animals, and grow your business. Okay, um, so that forty-nine percent. Okay, what does that what does that mean? So we tend to work with a lot of hog people. Um, so uh, if you are cutting uh, three days a week, so that means you're getting carcasses in, and you can get um, you can get six in a day, um, and with an average um, retail sale of nine dollars and ninety nine cents. So that is what um, at farmers markets around where I am, um, ground pork sells at. All right. 
your carcass costs um, to get it processed and get it in for cut and wrap here in Maine is, you know, around 375. All right. I will, I, you know, I can talk you through doing this with your own numbers is that your monthly profit, including the, um, including the financing cost of the locker, because we have a financing plan, we are, we are looking at over $3,000. Now I am happy to work with you to make sure that these numbers are actually, um, where you would be at. But if you think about that, that's a $36,000 a year um, facility on your farm that already takes into account paying for a butcher, okay, and paying a living wage for a butcher. And so you can add in a living wage for a packer. You can, and then you can take that and you can go and sell. It, okay, so we're going to walk through this with um, a couple others. So here's the one that really kind of blows me away. Um, to cutting two cattle a day. So cattle have to come in in what we call luggable chunks or cattle quarters um, because it's not tall enough uh, to, do a whole, uh, to do a whole half of a, um, a steer, all right? Um, Grass-fed, you know, pastured, locally labeled, that sort of stuff. Um, retails for $7.99. Um, you can buy that in for about $3.25. All right, we are looking at a gigantic monthly profit. Now I keep going to people and asking them to prove me wrong on this number and nobody has. So by all means, somebody prove me wrong on this number because that, like, I wanna go and like start raising cattle. But if you think about it, that's, that's pretty reasonable because again, a pasture raised, grass fed, even if it's, you know, barley finished or whatever, um, we, are, we are slaughtering those steers between 24 and 27 months Okay, and so that that profit has to cover all of that. So, okay, and so for lambs, the you know this is the real tricky thing. We live in we live in Maine, and it's perfect for small ruminants, but um, they we don't get the return on it, and the carcass costs are high, so the monthly profit is low. But I really think that there are ways to to do this and start making value added products. Um, with lamb that we can drive this number up and we can better utilize whole carcasses and, and create a better demand chain for, for lamb. Okay, so what does it mean for you? What, what do we do? So over here, we have different, you know, we kind of have different units that we sort of benchmarked. Um, and this, the, um, this lays out what those investment costs are. Um, and at the top where we talk, talk about um, a unit cost, um, that is of a, you know, a unit with um, a sink and refrigeration and a rail and HACCP planning um, and you supply everything else all the way to the unit that's, you know, more than twice that where it's got, you know, like an Arcos curing chamber in it, that sort of thing. Um, you are responsible for getting it from Maine to your facility. Um, this uh, pouring a pad doesn't have to be all that expensive. That hookup is um, in, in totally dependent um, on where it goes. Okay, so there are places, if you don't have to jackhammer a floor in an industrial park, you're going to be well under $15,000. Okay, but we did, you know, worst case scenario when you're selling something, so nobody's surprised, um, which gets us to a total price to get it on the ground. And uh, we have financing available, okay? So I can help you get this. I can put you in touch with somebody um, to help get this financed. And then that's your weekly cost. Now, as you go back through, if you look back, um, you know, we're recording this webinar, you'll see um, that I included that per week cost in the ROI on doing those different animals. <laughs> Okay, and so that's where we are, and I think I'm at time. <laughs> so as we um, switch over, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop screen sharing, and I will uh, go over and look at the look at the questions and try and answer them. So thank you all so much for your attention, and I look forward to any questions, and I look forward to Dave's presentation. All right, so if folks want to uh, type in a few questions into the Q&A box, Michelle will take a few questions before we transition to David. So does anyone have any questions? Okay, the first one is the unit costs consist of what? And then how are the hookup costs different? The unit, the unit cost is how much the box itself 
costs and and then the hookup costs is what it costs to get sewage water and electricity at your place to um the unit okay so if if you are um putting it in the middle of a of, you know a field where you have an office and a bathroom and that sort of thing but it's kind of far from where your electric is and where your um you know where your sewage and it doesn't mean sewer it means you know actual you know getting refuse out of there um and electricity water and electricity it's going to be more expensive if you drop it in a um in a uh, industrial park and you don't have to pour a pour a footing and um you can plug and play it's going to be significantly less expensive than that mm -hmm. david asks is a septic system allowable for most approvals yes mm -hmm. yes you can i have done approvals on town sewage on septic systems on um leach fields <laughs> um, yeah and so that's a, actually the usda only requires a letter from your town authority and if your town authority says it's good the usda is happy with it mm. patrick asks what does the usda say about these units will it pass their inspection criteria I have uh, I have talked with the USDA. Um, they're very excited. They're mostly excited that you know they would be inspecting the same units with the same kind of food safety planning in Virginia and Vermont. You know what I mean? And so they're actually looking at it to make their their job easier. <laughs> so they're very they're very excited about it. Um, I have a significant amount of experience getting plants through the USDA, and I am. I am extremely confident that this will get through USDA inspection and we'll work with you until it does. <laughs> Adam asks, what is the lead time from designing and finalizing details on a box to a finished box that is ready to leave Maine? Uh, between four and six weeks. Wow, that's pretty awesome. And Jennifer says, do you need to have a USDA inspector on site every time you are using the facility? If not, no, that's what's awesome about this. Okay, so the USDA um, doesn't have enough inspectors. And for cut and wrap, for everything that's not slaughter, you don't have to have an inspector on site. And so they can come and spend, you know, they are required by law to give you 40 hours a week. But if you do this, they are required to give you an inspector, but your inspector doesn't need to be there 40 hours a week, okay? And so it requires really good communication with the inspector, but no, the inspector does not have to be there all the time. Nicole asks, do you have experience creating food safety plans for a unit that would be used as a co-pack, meaning used by different businesses or different products? Yes, so I have a whole entire other presentation on cooperative ownership of USDA inspectable facilities. <laughs> but that's another hour long talk. <laughs> well, send, if you're interested in that, why don't folks just send Michelle an email and yeah. get in touch with you. Um, I'm going to have to hold any other questions until the end. Um, and David, would you like to share your screen now? Sure, I will. Hello, everybody, and Michelle, that was awesome. I'm inspired. Very cool that you have taken on the entrepreneur role. I love that. Okay, so um, am, I, am I good to go there, Rebecca? Okay, so uh, David Schaefer, Featherman Equipment, thanks for, thanks for joining me. Um, I'm a, a farmer turned uh, entrepreneur as well, or entrepreneur farmer turned uh, manufacturer. And I keep getting led forward by um, customers who um, are, are uh, increasingly braver than I ever was. So um, that's led to the concept of the plant in a box. And by way of introduction of the plant in a box, I'm going to take you through what I discovered as a, as a manufacturer of backyard processing equipment. Uh, I, what I discovered that was really working for folks um, on their farm and, and uh, the, the plant in a box is a culmination of basically 20 years of gleaning uh, how how the best operations made money and compiling those those features and characteristics um, into a into a finished product to to really be a an economic generator for folks. Okay, so to begin with, we need to just take a a, a brief look at processing economics. And if you want to do a little exercise and you have a, a sheet of paper, which you probably do in a pen. Just make a make uh, five columns that say five, ten, fifteen, twenty, and twenty-five 
for your birds per hour, and then plug in your own numbers uh, based on your operation of um, um, how many people are typically on your crew. So under the 5, 10, 15, 20, 25, plug in three, four, five, however many people is typical. Of course, you can change this later on. And then and then you, you get a, a number like 40 birds gross, 80 birds, 120, 160, 200. Then multiply that product by the average um, cost of uh, custom processing birds in your area. And that's probably going to be between three and five or maybe six dollars per bird. And that gives you a per hour uh, gross return to your processing um, enterprise. The point of this exercise being the huge discrepancy between a five bird per hour operation that's per person, which is very typical at starting, and a 25 bird per hour operation. We're going to look at some we're going to look at some uh, various numbers on on real live farms and to see what what uh, kind of difference this can make. But this is the promise. There there is a huge economic potential in uh, in processing, and you have to be efficient to do it. So that's that's the point of this graph. Uh, it behooves you to get to know birds per hour. So quickly, we're going to run through the big six of processing that I've identified: efficient layout of stations, an automatic scald matched equipment, a rotary kill station, automatic evisceration line, and the 30-second evisceration. And we're, we'll see a lot of plant in a box through this before we get specifically to the equipment inside a plant in a box. So station layout, the idea being you don't waste a lot of time. So things are close together, you don't walk around, maximum efficiency of workers. So you see at the end of this plant in a box is a kill, uh, kill station. There will be um, crates on the ground and outside the unit. Um, right next to that. And so the, the operator um, does not have to move up and down a line. He simply rotates that uh, rotary kill station uh, as birds go into it, and then they come out into the scalder, come out into the plucker, and from another point of view, onto the receiving table and onto um, the evisceration line. We never want to have extra steps. Second thing is the almighty automatic scald. So very, very important. And uh, just two days ago, um, this will be my one little Featherman advertisement, we introduced uh, Scalder Pro, uh, which uh, changes this, this whole, whole uh, game of scalding on any type of scale. We develop, developed it specifically for the plant in a box. This uh, heats water from empty to ready to process in eight minutes, uh, keeps a flat line temperature at 360 birds per hour when I tested the prototype. Um, actually varied from 149 to 147, but I'm calling that flat line. That's pretty fast and that's not much variation. Didn't slow anything down. Uh, it operates by overflowing hot water. And I'll uh, probably talk a little bit more about that. So um, there's always clean water coming in and uh, dirty water from the bottom, the, any, any sediments being um, overflowed out. So the water at the end of the, the scalding day is just as clean as the water at the beginning. And uh, those of you with experience know how the scald water can degrade and the, uh, the scald itself can, can just disappear. And in fact, in, in, uh, in the big, big chicken operations, they, they actually empty their tanks and start over again because uh, degraded, dirty scald water doesn't work. We have a safety shield in the plant in a box. It's not a big big issue because nobody can get behind there where the pinch point is, but it's just a feature. There's no open flame underneath. We are not heating the bottom of a stainless steel tank to heat water, which is very inefficient. There is a an on-demand uh, commercial grade water heater. So we're adding very hot water to water directly. It's very efficient. We also have a very efficient uh, drivetrain, uh, right angle um, gear motor combination, no chains. It's very reliable, has a lot of torque, and this is uh, a solution that's $4,000 cheaper than a, uh, the stainless steel uh, competition that's out there. Okay, second thing is matched equipment. By that I mean um, the equipment is fully utilized all the time. So with a scalder that can do uh, nine or ten birds at a time uh, in a one-minute cycle, and same for the plucker, we need to have... Um, twice as many kill stations when the bleed out takes two minutes. So I see this a lot. Um, 
mismatched equipment. I'll show you a picture of it here. Um, when, when the equipment is not matched, uh, you're basically wasting a piece of equipment. Here's a, uh, a shot of the corner of a, an Italian uh, container, containerized processing unit that was extremely uh, um, sleek and uh, well-engineered and designed. Everything's built in. Look at that um, scalding apparatus. Three out of the four stations are, are occupied. But um, the cones right there before the station, which are nice and close, so there's no, no wasted effort there, there's only four of them. So if bleed out takes two minutes and scald takes one minute, what's happening to the scald station half the time? It's completely unutilized. So that's what I mean by matched equipment. And here's uh, the next item is rotary kill station, whether it's eight cones, 18 cones, 12, doesn't matter. The point is a person is not walking around carrying birds, which is stressful for the birds. They are um, very efficient in all their movements. Now. I'm not sure in this particular um, configuration if the kill stand has been moved away from the scalder, but you'll notice that the, the kill stand, uh, somebody's gonna have to take a couple of steps with birds to get to the scalder. So that's what I mean by just a slight um, layout challenge. And it's not a big deal, but those steps add up. But this is a pretty cool um, way of having a very clean look at uh, look at the pass through window there so their evisceration room stays nice and clean this is um not an inspected facility just a sort of a preemptive um very very clean very nice facility okay or um, on the larger scale rotary uh, kill stations can be 12 or 18 two farms uh, falling sky in arkansas and polyface farms in in uh, shenandoah valley both came to us about the same time and said, if we just had a rotary kill station, I think we could hit 200 birds per hour, which is sort of a, uh, uh, was a magic unattained number, but you'll see that many people have attained it. And so what we came up with uh, was being prototyped there on the left picture at Falling Sky Farms. And that's a, has an adjustable height on it so that uh, workers of various heights can be fairly comfortable at that uh, task. Automatic evisceration line uh, was uh, pointed out to be me by Greg Gunthorpe, uh, one of our gurus in, in, in the uh, field. He uh, notes that you can't incentivize workers on a, on a um, per piece um, compensation. That is uh, fostering repetitive injury um, syndromes and uh, OSHA definitely doesn't like it. But what you can do is you can have a variable speed evisceration line and have a dial set where everybody's pretty much hopping. And uh, Greg, Greg is uh, like the current winner in birds per hour. And this is uh, part of the secret sauce, that and a well-trained crew. Notice that the posture on these two workers is nice and upright. Imagine working at a table. If you've done it, you know it. I've done it a lot. Your back definitely suffers from bending over a table. There is no cross-contamination if and when um, an intestine is ruptured or a bile gland is um, ruptured, that mess goes straight down, not sliding across a table where the next 300 birds are gonna slide across. And as you can see in this um, picture, gravity is on your side. So those are four really good reasons to favor an automatic evisceration line over um, a work table. But even if it's not automatic, you're getting three out of four of those goodies. You just don't have that, that giddy up incentive. But uh, um, some of my neighbors in Jamesport using, uh, using our shackles outside. And then on the lower right is uh, Tom Delahanty, the very first organic uh, pasture poultry raiser who uh, got up to um, 50,000 birds a year at one time in Socorro, New Mexico, using this system you see. Imagine how fast he could have gone with an automatic line. Okay, so the last thing I really can't help you with except with my training videos, and that's a 30-second evisceration. Whether you're uh, out um, in the yard under the shed or uh, have a USDA inspector by your side, you have to cultivate people that get the 30-second evisceration done. And we, we provide videos and how-to on that, but uh, can't, can't, can't buy that. All right, so we will look at um, some... Uh, real live economics. Uh, our very first unit went to uh, Maple Wind Farms in uh, Burlington, Vermont. Bless them and their courageousness. I uh, just saw Bruce two days ago. And uh, um, 
what what they discovered I'm going to give you year two. The first year was under state inspection, second and third years have been under USDA inspection. They are um, now operating at five hundred, five to 600 birds per uh, four hour morning. And this is, I'm talking about birds into chill. Okay, so this is just through that processing line you saw. With uh, six to seven operators, that's a, a rate of about 125 to 150 um, birds per hour for the whole group, which dials down to 20 to 25 birds per person per hour. Bruce um, is paying a, a relatively high average salary um, compared to across the nation, uh, $15 an hour. And he uh, charges for custom butchering $5.50 a bird. So if you uh, plug that number into all birds and say he's charging himself $5.50 as well as his customers, at 125 birds through the unit, which is the conservative side of his estimates, he's grossing $687 per hour. And if you take off his uh, greatest costs, um, they estimate, uh, or we estimate 90% of direct costs in processing are labor. So if you take off the labor charge of $15 per hour times seven employees, and subtract 105 bucks from 687, you get a, a net uh, of uh, $582 per hour. And uh, Bruce also pointed out that he's been 13 weeks running with no E. coli or salmonella positives. Now let's look at Greg Cunthorpe Farm. He does not operate out of a box. Greg's been doing this for quite a few years, but it's a very, very small plant, perhaps the smallest USDA plant in the country. Greg is hitting the incredible speed of 360 birds per hour with nine operators. That's a, that's a 40 bird per person per hour rate. I didn't even put that on my chart because it just, seems way out there for folks who know what backyard processing looks like. His average salary is actually below $15 an hour, but I plugged in 15 um, at 360 birds times 450, and I've since learned it's actually $4 he charges, but um, I get $16.20 per hour gross. It's actually $14.40 per hour gross, and uh, take off his, um, off his uh, labor which I, again, I said was 90% uh, of your direct cost. The others being things like ice and bags, electricity, water. That's an incredible net of $1,485 per hour. Actually, it would be more like $1,300 per hour, which is a lot of return per hour in anybody's book. And that doesn't, that hour isn't necessarily five days a week. That hour is any days a week. It's sustainable. He's getting good numbers on cleanliness. A review of the equipment inside and a specific look at some of the new things. I'm going to show you some pictures of the, the box that was just came out of our fabrication this weekend, went to Lubbock, Texas. Um, so uh, looking down into the box, we have the receiving table, the, the evisceration line, um, stainless sinks, aluminum walls, 20 gauge aluminum. Uh, white. We're very particular about the colors and the lighting in here. I'll show you a little more about this. I'm assuming everybody can get this video. If not, someone tell me. Yeah, it looks good, David. Thank you.
Okay, so I hope everybody got that. Um, you know, homegrown video. Um, just to answer David and uh, Matthew, David, no, haven't um, addressed ethnic or religious requirements uh, as of yet. Matthew, yes, uh, uses LP or um, natural gas. That's that's the scalder. David's question was, uh, what, does the scalder use gas? Yep, I'll I'll go into that a little bit more, um, Matthew. Just a minute here. Okay, now I'm there. We go. Okay, so let's let's dial in and look at this. Is these are pictures I took um, two days ago from the unit going to Lubbock, Texas. So it's a um, very fresh out of the shoot. And uh, we're looking at the evisceration line, all stainless steel, um, variable speed, very quiet. You're seeing both ends of it, the motor and the idler end. Um, this is in a nine foot, also known as high cube container. And notice everywhere that all conduit pipes are offset. So um, we don't have um, bacteria harboring spots. In fact, we want inspectors to want to get our job. They want to go to the plant in the box. Um, I don't have my inspector seat showing, but I've sourced a, 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 a real fancy but not that expensive chair that's actually for tattoo artists. And it has a real thick pad and a nine inch hydraulic lift on it, which Michelle knows. And, and some of you also do, I'm sure that in the big plants, the they're required to have a hydraulic you know, height adjustment for the quote, vertically unchallenged, or vertically challenged, unquote, inspectors. So this is my answer. I really want the inspectors to feel like this is made with them in mind. And, and as Michelle uh, said, it's, it's really important to me that we develop a cookie cutter HACCP plan and standard operating, operating procedures. And that these things are just like, you know, touch me not. We're not going to, we're not going to get uh, victimized uh, as some small plants can be, because we're, we're going to, first of all, be very acceptable to begin with. And then, uh, and then very inspector and not bacteria friendly. Okay, so in the, on the lower right, that's just the control of the variable speed motor for the VIS line. Shot of the power panel, AC and heater. Stainless sinks operated by knee, stainless soap dispenser and uh, towel, and, uh, and then just a, a detail on, on the uh, customized offsets that we made. Double doors, automatic louvers. We're drawing air from the clean end through the pass-through window, out a vent over the scalder. And then our bottle jar lights. A little bit about the siding pad. Absolutely the same thing as what Michelle um, spoke about. We suggest three options. The gravel pad and the corner piers are what have been used so far. They're cheaper, they're fine. We suggest a one inch slope in every 10 feet and we port the effluent right out the back end and recommend and we'll give you plans and a stainless steel grate to, um, to, to make yourself a little trough, a gutter, imagine a, you know, a dairy parlor. And from there, the, uh, the water goes into a, a hold, holding tank, a small holding tank with a sump pump and then you take it wherever you need to go. But you can, you can see our two, uh, or two drain lines porting right there. David, right. I think we need to move to uh, Q&A for both of you. Um, okay. Do you want to share the, the numbers here real quick? Yeah, I will. I had an estimate there, you can, just to give people a general idea. But quickly, um, gross income potential, looking at four different scenarios from, four, uh, from 20,000 to 200,000 birds per year. And, um, uh, three different options of price per birds. As I said, in your area, it's probably three to five bucks. Gross income potential can range from 60,000 to 100,000 per year at only 20,000 bird um, level. Um, at an ability to do 200 birds per hour easily um, with a trained crew. And so that equates to a 1,000 bird uh, morning. Um, at, at 200 days of operation, um, we get uh, range from 600000 to a $1 million in gross income, depending on the price of birds in your area. So um, inc incredible income generating potential is what that's all about. And I am ready for questions. All right, okay. folks. So we'll take questions for both David and Michelle. Uh, the first question from Beverly is, can you put the previous screen back up? I think it showed the cost of the unit. 
Okay. Sure. Um, yeah. Just the one before it. Yep. There we go. That is kind of an important one to some people. <laughs> so it looks like total costs with delivery is 112000 Yes, that's assuming a $4,000 delivery charge and uh, some HACCP training consulting. Uh, I just threw some in there. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dusky. That's pretty, pretty close Dusky to write up for right now. Thank you, David. Uh, mm -hmm. Michelle, Dusky has a question for you. Um, is a diamond plate really approved by USCA as a cleanable surface? What is the capacity of the curing chamber you suggest in pounds? And are there floor drains in the locker? Uh, the answer is yes, but if you don't want diamond plate, you don't have to have it. Um, there are floor drains and the poundage capacity depends on what you're curing. Um, and so that's, you know, it's, it's designed to be able to, to move um, uh, 64, no, I'm trying to think of this off my head, but 64 kilos of um, pork times six times three days a week. Um, and so it's a pretty, if you get, if you get good racking in there um, and you use the space efficiently, it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of pork, <laughs> you know, where, I mean, we're talking about, you know, between a thousand to 1500 pounds off the ballpark off the top of my head. And the floor, and are there floor drains in the locker? Yeah. So the floor drains are under the three compartment sink um, for use. Um, you know, because I want to keep drains out of a potential place where meat is curing because of the listeria risk. Okay, so the drain is in the raw side, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, Abra asks, do either of the panelists have experience working with Canadian clients? Yes, I do. I've um, I've worked with a lot of Canadian clients. What's the particular question on on? Um, Basically, um, is this with this? Can it be done in Canada? Yeah. Canada is kind of tough. I, I uh, helped uh, a, a fellow named Jerry Brinders in the uh, um, out out west, in uh, in um, and uh, he uh, he developed with the help of the Canadian government three mobile units that were um, kind of foundational in in my um, evolution of this whole idea. They were they had uh, each of them had their own set of docking sites and individual regulations, and it was a that was a very, very tough nut to crack, and it eventually folded. But I assume that Abra's question is about viability in Canada, but I'm not sure what it is, and I haven't seen more come in on that. Yeah. But, but uh, I'll answer Susan while Abra may be, may be um, giving me more direction. Susan asks, can ducks, turkeys, geese, quail be processed in the poultry unit? Yep, 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 and yep. But ducks, we say, are a four-letter word. <laughs> um, God made them waterproof. They're really hard. And uh, same thing with geese. Uh, quail and turkey are pretty much no-brainers for us. Ducks and geese are, are doable. The main thing being that you have to process during a molt. And if you are doing custom processing, you cannot take any waterfowl when they're not in a molt. It's just a nightmare. Michelle, I don't remember quail or voluntary inspection, not USDA. So you got to keep FDA or USDA voluntary in mind if you're doing quail. Mm. Michelle, have you worked with any Canadian clients, and do you think you could get a box into Canada? I am, I am confident I can get a box into Canada, and these are actually designed to be, um, they're shipping containers and designed to be shipped overseas, not that from Maine to Canada one goes overseas, but they can be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we have time for a couple more questions, folks. Any, any other questions? Uh, David Tubbs asks, do you also have a pre-designed mobile poultry processing plant? That must be for me. Um, David, I'm not um, an advocate of mobile processing. I don't know of any that are making money. Um, they're a service. There are some that are successful in, in that they're a good service to areas that are undersupplied. But the, the um, economics and logistics, it's already a logistically stacked deal to process chickens. And to add the vagaries, uh, the uncertainties of getting, your, getting each um, area's um, 
regulations approved, getting people there, getting the inspector there, getting the birds there. Um, it's sexy, I know. I built a mobile processing unit. I learned the hard way. They're very, very difficult to manage. So I recommend citing one of these, bringing the, bringing the, bringing the animals to it. Um, for both of you, what is the um, electrical needs? Is it two phase, three phase, how many volts? I'll go first since I'm already on the screen or yeah, I, mean, I don't know. I'm, I'm single, single phase. Um, I just knocked myself out. I'm single phase and uh, yeah, we have 220. As long as we have 220, uh, we're good. Michelle? Ditto. That's, yeah, that's, these are, yeah, these are not designed to be used with three phase. If you're interested in three phase because you want to use it for long term cooling, um, we are happy to talk to you about that, but it only makes sense if you situate yourself near an electrical station that actually provides three phase power. Okay, I think probably the last question uh, we can take is from Brooks. Uh, she says, Greg Gunthorpe slaughters pigs on the same space as his poultry. Is there any way pork could fit in with a poultry slaughter? Facility? Yeah, Brooks, you're looking into the future with us. Um, I keep turning myself off. Yep. Um, right now, um, they're, they're, um, you know, they're sized and correct for small animals, sheep and goats and small pigs. Um, a stretched out pig, correct me if I'm wrong, Michelle, is about nine close to nine feet. So in a high cube, you could just about do it. You could certainly do it if you had a, a kill area where, where, and a sanitary area outside, say, dropped down where you could break the carcass in half and then, and then take the uh, animal in there. Yep. And Michelle, likewise, could yours be used for poultry? Yeah, I mean, but I have to tell you, I would rec what I would recommend is is that um, you talk to Dave and do poultry slaughter, and then if you want to cure duck prosciuttos or do poultry value added processing, I Dave and I haven't actually talked about this, but I can't imagine there's not a way for our units to hook up end to end, <laughs> where you kill in one spot and then you cure and value add production in another spot. So I think that's probably, and when people ask me whether or not I'm going to include red meat slaughter, there are, again, the idea is go modular, not mobile. There are, I would, I would recommend parking a mobile slaughter facility next to this and slaughter in one spot and move through this. And um, just, just because the whole mobile thing is really so challenging. <laughs> well, we are past the hour. Oh. I'd so, love to hear Patrick's question answered. Oh, well, Patrick asks, is Michelle using the refrigeration in the refrigerated container? Yeah, you mean using, you mean using it as a, as a critical control point in processing? That's what it's designed for. No, I think he's saying, is that the source of the refrigeration or is there a supplemental? Oh, no, 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 no. Those... By the time that these hit market, these are single-use containers. The refrigerate, the refrigeration unit is taken off of them, and new refrigeration units are put and and or HVACs or whatever are put on them. Okay, so you add that on top. Yeah. Um, all right. Well, um, Michelle and David, if you could type your emails in the chat box, if people yep. have additional questions for either Michelle or David specifically, please feel free to email them. Uh, or you can also email me if you have any other questions or suggestions for webinars. Uh, we will be sending you an evaluation by email in the next couple days and hope that you can fill it out. And we really appreciate you taking the time to be with us for the last hour. Uh, it's been really interesting. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Someone asked about a recording. Again, this, this was recorded. I'm going to put a link to the Learn event. Uh, we'll put a link to the YouTube uh, recording there and I think that'll be on Rebecca's YouTube uh, channel so uh, you can either go directly to her YouTube space and find that or you can go to the, the learn event and we'll also post it there all thank right you, thank well you, thank you thank you everyone bye everyone. everyone bye bye See you, Michelle.